thank you very much. Well, first of all, it's very nice to see such a full room. Um, I hope that um, the uh, <coughs> interest in Palestine and Palestinian affairs continues and grows. Now, um, the question of Britain's responsibility to the Balfour Declaration is something that uh, obviously Palestinians feel very strongly. And um, I just want to give you an idea to tell you something that my father, once I remember, said, um, uh, talking about uh, how we lost our homeland and uh, how and, and Britain's role. He said, if you leave your, uh, the, the doors of your house wide open and a burglar comes in and burns you, Whose fault is it, the burglar or you, for keeping the doors open? And that, you know, I think sums up the, the way that uh, Britain's role in this. Now, it's left to me to talk a little bit about how uh, the effect of this on the Palestinians, the effect of Gulf War on the Palestinians. Uh, well, to start with, and right from the beginning, the, the Gulf War Declaration did not consult the uh, population of Palestine about what was going to happen to them. There was no consultation. On the contrary, there was a denigration of that population, expressed in various ways, and uh, remains, by the way, I think remains largely today. Um, the um, Palestinians resisted, the people of Palestine resisted the, the Balfour Declaration from very early on. They were aware of what Zionism was doing from the end of the 19th century, and they were very worried about it. Um, and we know that very early on, Palestinians tried to be conciliatory towards the Zionists in, in, with the idea that they could somehow contain Zionism. Um, now, uh, the, the, the problem that faced the Palestinians, and one really has to understand this, is that it was terribly difficult for them, given the fact that there was a British mandate. Because you, you have a ruling power, which is Britain, uh, which is obviously facilitating the Zionist project. What can you do as the Palestinians? You put your place, yourself in the place of the Palestinians. What actually can you do against that? It's very hard because your rulers, whom you cannot actually hope to win against because they're, they're too powerful, are themselves facilitating a project which is damaging you. So how do you, how do you play this? Now, it is a fact that and the Palestinians, and one has to always bear this in mind in any understanding of the history of this, uh, they were not uh, a highly educated people. They were not a people who were used to Europe. They didn't understand Europe or European history. So for them to know how to maneuver and negotiate with this Western presence in their midst, that is Britain, uh, was, very, was really very difficult. So they opted for, quite early on, these are the new tools I'm talking about, they opted for a conciliatory method a sort of idea that look, we can't fight this force that's the British, so let us be uh, use compromise, uh, try to talk, this sort of thing. Now at the same time as that was happening amongst the notables, there was a very different sort of thing going on amongst the ordinary people of Palestine, most of whom were actually peasants they could see what was happening, and they had their own method of fighting it. They resisted it uh, by all the means that they had, right from early on. And that's when you have the, the riots of 1929, the so-called Wayne War, so war riots, <coughs> and the killings of Jews, and which ultimately resulted in many killings of Arabs as well. And that people's resistance continued and uh, became uh, much, much bigger by 1936, something that John touched on, the general strike 
the big revolt by the Palestinian people against the British, primarily against the British, for allowing the Zionists to come into their homeland. Uh, and uh, in the 1936 uh, revolt is really very interesting and very important because it, it actually, before it, prior to the actual, to the way it blew up and became a revolution, just before that, <clears throat> the Palestinian, this is the Palestinian ordinary people, had started, had devised a non-violent resistance against the, the, the presence of Jews amongst them, including boycott. I mean, I don't know how many people know this, but they actually called for a boycott of Jewish goods in, in the early 1930s. They had they practiced non-violent resistance, but they got, they got nowhere uh, for reasons which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later on. Okay, so the 1936 uh, uh, revolt uh, big revolt by the Palestinians took place 36 to 39 um, um, and um, um, led to the, the Pew Commission, which uh, uh, as previous commissions have done, um, this uh, reported that the, the problem with, with in Palestine was the, the presence of, of, of these of Jews and that this had to be sorted out in some way, in one way or another, and Peel suggested partitioning the country, but also suggested, in, uh, also discussed the possibility of one binational state. Now, um, what did it actually mean, therefore, for the Palestinians? Well, what it meant was, first of all, land loss. Now, I cannot say too strongly how important this is. It was the loss of land which actually made the ordinary Palestinians so angry and so willing to, to fight to try and keep their land. Land loss was something which, of course, the Zionists knew very much about. They knew that they would get nowhere unless they actually had control of land. So there, there was a, a sort of a, a battle going on between um, uh, Zionists who, who bought land, uh, uh, peasants who saw themselves dispossessed, and uh, as a result, by 1931, 22% of the Palestinian rural population was landless. Now, if you realize that most of the inhabitants of Palestine were rural, you see how important this is. Um, that was the first thing, land loss. But the second thing, which also hasn't been talked about too much, is that the people who came into Palestine were alien. They were alien. They were Europeans. They were different. They looked different. They spoke a different language, and they behaved differently. And we have testimony of people, for example, quite conservative. Palestinians are conservative. Most of them are Muslims seeing uh, uh, Jewish girls walking along in shorts, um, behaving as they would consider improperly. All this was very, uh, it was an assault on their culture, quite apart from the land loss that I just talked about. Um, and the Palestinians were treated as second-class people all the time under the mandate. For example, uh, Palestinian education was capped at the sub-university level, so that Palestinians could, they had schools, and they could go to colleges, but they could not go to, because there was no university and it was not encouraged. Remember at the time that the Hebrew university was flourishing. At the same time, in every single official uh, posting uh, within the mandate, every single position was uh, an important position was held by Jews, and Palestinians had a subordinate position. Um, uh, <clears throat> further, and, and then, the, 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 uh, remember that the British uh, cracked down on any resistance extremely harshly, extremely severely. And we have, from the 1940s, the so-called emergency laws under the mandate uh, to try and uh, control resistance and those emergency laws are the very same that Israel uses against the Palestinians today. 
past evolutions, execution of leaders, and so on. This was all going on long before Israel was established. Now, um, <clears throat> um, by 1938, after the Peel Commission, there was more and more violence, there was more, more, more disruption, uh, and what began to appear, which was really very damaging to the Palestinians, was infighting amongst themselves. <laughs> so that they had by then become uh, uh, divided into groups who, um, uh, who didn't agree with each other, and there was not only fighting, but killings. This is inter-Palestinian killings, on top of all the problems that they faced uh, against Zionism. And of course, um, uh, this all this led inexorably to my main subject this evening, which is the Nakba. There was this hotel in a road above our house called the Semiramis Hotel. The Semiramis was a hotel which used to have a, a lot of international people staying, uh, journalists, foreign visitors, and so on. Uh, on a night in January, this hotel was blown up by the Jewish army, um, Haganah, and uh, that was the earliest memory I have of that there was something very frightening going on uh, around me in my life. And that, uh, the destruction service was so effective, it was so terrifying, that most of the people in our part of Jerusalem left after that. Of course, temporarily, as they believed, but they, they did leave. We were some of the few families who remained living in West Jerusalem and left in 1948 after the Deir Yassin massacre, mm -hmm. which frightened a lot of Palestinians, a lot of people into living. Um, now, of course, in, in our story, uh, having, having to, leave, to leave in fear, uh, really in fear of our lives, and in, in a sort of very untidy and disorderly exit from our country because we didn't think that we would be away for long. And uh, my mother had packed a, a small case for, for five of us because she didn't think that we would need very much more because we'd be away for maybe a couple of weeks and things would quite settle down. Now, that experience, the fact that, of course, they didn't settle down, the fact that we fled from Jerusalem uh, to Damascus in our case because my mother's side of the family is Syrian. <coughs> but, the, but, the, but the memory of um, the, the sort of bus station in Jerusalem uh, with crowded with families trying to get into taxis, trying to flee was really unforgettable. People crying, people saying goodbye to others who couldn't come with them, uh, and so on. Now, that experience, of course, is indelibly imprinted on my memory, and every, every other Palestinian who had to leave in 1948, I'm sure, bears the same indelible memories, so but the same for them. And though I talk about how sad that was for us, of course, it was really very uh, slight in, when you think of it in perspective, when you think of the 750,000 people who left Palestine, and of course not all of them left in 1948, a third of them had already <coughs> left before May 1948, a fact that the Zionists have, have tried to conceal for, uh, for, for years, but which of course we knew very well. So that kind of forced, forced migration, what can I say, it's a form of partly expulsion, partly fleeing from, from the fear of what was happening, um, it was something so enormous that really we still do not have a proper history of that uh, event, those events. The Palestinians themselves who had suffered it could not bear the trauma of trying to revisit what had happened. Uh, many of them tried to suppress their memories, and 
To this day, we lack a history of exactly how, uh, not, not, not just how the expulsions happened, but how people, what happened to them, exactly what happened to them. So, um, okay, so that was the left of 1948. Now, however, the effect of blood for lives on. It lives on. It's certainly not, as my colleagues have pointed out on this panel, it's, it's, it's relevant today. It's not a piece of old history. It's relevant. Why? Because the effect on the Palestinians has gone on and gone on and gone on. It is for that reason that the Palestinians have been dispersed into various groupings. Those who live in refugee camps to this day, and any of you who ever visited these camps will know what I mean, how tragic this is and how unending it seems to them. Because who knows what's going to happen to these people? What is the solution? Not what is the solution, but who is going to help them to get out of this situation that they're in? And you have to think of the Palestinians of Lebanon, uh, uh, to think of a very, very bad example of how the Palestinians are. So the Palestinians in camps, they're the Palestinians under occupation and under siege in Gaza. There are the Palestinians who live as second class citizens in Israel. There are the Palestinians who are in exile and who have very insecure lives. They don't live in camps, but they are at the mercy of the host country where they are. And you, I can give you recent examples of how insecure and unreliable that is. If you look at Kuwait, the expulsions of Palestinians from Kuwait, the expulsions in Libya when Gaddafi was alive, and he didn't approve the Oslo Agreement, so he threw these Palestinians out. The Palestinians from Iraq, because of the invasion of Iraq. The Palestinians now, today, are from Syria. Uh, an unending story, an unending disaster, really. Uh, and that is what Darfur did. Now, I will mention, because it's certainly true, the Jews from Arab lands, who also are the result of Darfur. Because as you all know here, the Zionist state was anxious to get uh, the people into the state, and therefore a number of um, a number of tricks and devices. Partly, partly, some of the Jews from Arab lands came over, and some of the others came over because of the hostility created by the creation of Israel. So there's the effect on all those people, and of course the effect on the region, which we must never forget. Six. Six Arab-Israeli wars, which from 1948 until today, the um, the, uh, the the fact that the people people uh, whether in Israel or, or whether they are whether they are Israeli Jews or whether they are Palestinians or Arabs have been reared in hostility. To think what that means that they have never really known what it means to be normal without having either a cause or having this enemy that you hate. That's the effect of uh, the creation of Israel, which comes from, from, from Balfour. But of course, the, arm, the armaments, the increased armaments throughout the region because of Israel. And today we have a new danger in Europe, which is the problem of Iran. If Israel indeed either itself attacks Iran or instigates the United States to do so, or the two do it together, I can hardly tell you of the catastrophe that would result from that. And in that, if you follow it historically, you will see is the exact consequence of allowing uh, a Zionist state to come into being and, the, and supporting it and, and, and nurturing it and uh, sustaining it for all these decades, that is the result. That is something I believe no one wants to see. And we tragically have, have, have had the tragic fate of housing uh, this entity that I don't think anybody would want anywhere near them. We have had the misfortune to actually be made to host them. And it is really high time that um, 
as our letter in the Guardian said today, that the British government, which was the originator of this disaster, without question, that the British government acknowledged that, not only apologized, but made regress to the victims of the, the policy that they practiced on an unsuspecting people, cynically and coldly and without the slightest concern for what would happen.